Let's get down into it so Pat can go vote. Um, <laughs> uh, welcome to History Schmistery. My name is Asher Wertheimer. Uh, Actually, I'm I don't think host. I'm... I'm not really feeling it. I don't think I'll go out. It's yeah, fine. yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can just we can just let this take over. Long. It'll take. I'm gonna come to your house and force you to vote. Um. Okay. Uh. I'm Asher Wertheimer, Wade Foster. Uh. What's up? What's going on? Good guy. Uh. Pat Fitzgerald, right here. That guy. Look at him. Oh, gorgeous. Um. And uh. Today, we're gonna be talking about things. Um. And it's election day, and we're not talking about election things because this is going to come out way after election day, and hopefully already we will know who the president is because, yeah, um, it'll be over a week. So, um, and I'm sure everyone's tired of hearing about it because no matter the result, it's going to be very talked about. So I chose to go with something in a totally different direction. Um, today, we're going to be talking tales of espionage specifically two stories of two amazing women in world war ii who served as spies for england for great britain so uh these are some great ones um that i did research on or shmi search for schmistery that's the joke is it's either history or schmistery i didn't do any research but we're gonna see, I don't get it. and we're gonna jump into it with some, with this crazy gal. Christiana Skarbek was born in 1908 in Warsaw, Poland, to a Roman Catholic count. Her father was a count. So he's money bags over here roman catholic count and her mother was jewish married in so she became a countess so this girl scarbeck was a major tomboy i'm talking uh uh cra crazy tomboy levels right now uh she would ride horses with her father they note that she rode horses um like just normally not side saddle like ladies were supposed to like she was like broom, broom, broom. um she was an and she was an expert skier so like she was doing all the things that all the boys were doing and like uh all the girls were doing very different things so she's already off to a rocking start her father passes away sadly when she's you know uh, grown up a little bit and her es the estate of her father is pretty near bankrupt so there's not a lot of money so she doesn't want to be a burden so what does she do she goes and gets a job at a car dealership so her mom doesn't have to support her your first question for this spy themed episode is what car company did she work for a volkswagen b fiat or c peugeot Pat, go ahead. Uh, what do you think? Uh, that third one sounded fake, so I'm saying C. <laughs> okay, Peugeot. Um, the, the French car manufacturer, yes. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that does uh, exist. Wade, what about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an actual one. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but yeah, it's bigger in Europe. Um, Wade, what about you? Uh, a. You said A, Volkswagen. Well... Points for no one is Fiat, which I actually didn't know Fiat existed at this time. Um, I didn't know it uh, existed. Volkswagen, I have no idea if Peugeot existed at the time. Volkswagen uh, would come later because Hitler would, you know, do all that. Um, uh. And we're not at World War II yet. Uh, so she eventually, she grows up and she marries a man named Jerry Gitsiki. Gitsiki. We'll call it Jerzy Gitsiki. It's a Polish name, and I, I have difficulty with them, really, honestly. I, I looked up some pronunciations, but... We're not a bank, Jerry. You know what? Just not to embarrass myself, I'm going to call him Jay. So Jay was a humongous human being. I mean, this guy was stacked. And that kind of uh, came into how he wooed her. So almost back-to-back -back questions. What did he do to earn the eye of all our heroine, Scarbeck. 
Did he A, fight off five men who were harassing her, B, rip a phone book in half, or C, save her when she was going out of control on a ski sco slope? Wade, the defending champion, uh, what do you think? A. I think A, he fought off five men who were harassing her. All right, Pat, what about you? C. You think C, he saved her when she was going out of control. Pat pulls into an early lead. He did. She was she was going wild down the ski slope, and this monster of a man steps in front of her and <coughs> catches her and stops her. I mean, like, this guy's huge. So, naturally, she marries him. Um, now, this guy also has his own bizarre story to tell. So, back to back to back questions. When this man ran away from home at 14 years old, what did he do? Did he A, work for a trapper in the USSR hunting bear? B, work as an assistant for an explorer in the Cambodian jungle? Or C, work as a cowboy and gold prospector in the United States? All right, Pat, what do you say? Uh, well... I was going to say A, because that would make more sense with the region, but you mentioned the word cowboy, so I have to say C. He has to say C. Contractually obligated. That's why I threw that one in there. Uh, Wade, what do you say? I'm going to go with a bear hunter. The bear hunter. Well, uh, Pat widens his lead. Route 2 cowboy yes. shoots. He went to the U.S., became a cowboy and gold prospector at Fort somehow made his way back to Europe to run into his love, Madame Scarbeck. I'm going to request so, you put a JPEG of a cowboy hat on my head here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try my hardest. Okay. Um, so, Germany invades Poland in September 1939, where they live. Uh, the two of them flee to London, where Scarbeck offers her uh, work. Uh, to the British Secret Intelligence Service, the SIS. She's eventually sent back to Poland. She sent a bunch of places first, but she eventually, she's hired on, sent back to Poland as a spy for the Special Operations Executive, the SOE. That is going to come back a lot in this episode, so SOE are basically spies for England. So she's sent back to Poland, uh, her home country, remember, in February 1940. Now, sending this girl back to her home country was, you know, benefit. She doesn't have to, like, put a cover story. You know, she's not French in Poland. She's just Polish in Poland. Drawback? Uh, what? What was one of the drawbacks for sending her back to her home country? A. She was recognized by an acquaintance at a cafe who yelled, Christina! Christina! Christina Scarbeck! What are you doing here? We heard that you'd gone abroad! B. All of the clothes she had were from England and stood out in a crowd because she left Poland with nothing but what she had on her back. Or C. A rival skier she had made on the slopes was a Nazi collaborator and was made capo for the town she was based in. Uh, Wade, what do you think? You could go with A. You can go with A. You think an acquaintance noticed her in a cafe and screamed her name across it. Okay. Pat? Uh, I'm going to say B. You say B. Her clothes made her stand out. Well, Wade narrows that gap. An acquaintance yelled her name at a, in a cafe and said, We thought you'd gone abroad. Chris, Christina. Christina Scarbeck. And Chris, Scarbeck naturally goes, Um... That's not me. And the woman's like, ah, it's you. She's like, no, it's not me. The woman's like, huh, I guess that's not you. I, I could have sworn it was you. And then left, and Christina was like, yeah, I'm just going to chill in this cafe for a little bit so I don't look suspicious, and dipped. So, like, she kept her cool, you know? And this is going to be a theme with these two ladies. They keep their cool. They, they're, they're tepid. They're, they're, they're cool, all right? Um, and that's going to be evidenced coming up. So, uh, she's already off to a great start as a spy. She helps out the SOE and MI6 by helping to plan routes for information to be smuggled from Warsaw to Budapest. 
On top of that, she spies for, you know, a German oil route so that she knows where the oil tankers go and how much oil they have and all this stuff. So she's sending information back left and right. In January 1941, she and an ally, uh, Andrei Koversky were arrested in Budapest. So the Hungarian police imprisoned them and they were questioned by the Gestapo. Of course, you know, the Nazi, like, secret police, you know, monsters. So, uh, because Hungary was a German ally, so the Gestapo had free reign. She did something pretty great in order to get out of this tight spot. What was it? Was it A, she bit her tongue until it bled, tricking a doctor into thinking she was sick with tuberculosis. B. She claimed she was a relative of Winston Churchill. C. She swiped a pistol from one of the Gestapo guards and shot her way out. Pat, what did you say? Well, I want the answer to be C, but I think it's going to be A, because he said they kept her cool. I think it's going to be A. All right, all right. Uh, Wade, what about you? Going with A as well. Going with A as well. Well, you're both right. Points for both of you. Uh, she bit her tongue until it bled, and the doctor was like, yeah, that's tuberculosis, all right? And they're like, <laughs> let her go. And they let her go. Uh, they let her and Kaversky go. Uh, I don't exactly know why. I guess they're like, yeah, they're going to die anyway. Or, like, people with tuberculosis can't be spies, I guess. Um, and so they let them go, and, um, they, they were like, yay, we're free, but we should probably leave, um, Hungary, because the police are obviously on to us, and they're following us. So they decide to ditch. The British ambassador helps them escape. He gets some British passports, which they actually use after the war to live in England, and they adopt those names later, so, like, double whammy there. Um, and he smuggles Scarbeck out in the trunk of his car. He puts her in the trunk of his car, drives her out, and what do they do? They rendezvous, because the two split up, uh, her and, uh, Kaversky split up, and they rendezvous in Belgrade, which is a European country, and there, what do they do once they're free from, you know, Nazi influence for the time being? Sure, they drink champagne in the nightclubs and belly dancing bars of Belgrade. So, like, they're, like, hey, vibing. Uh, she decides, hey, this Kaversky guy is kind of cool. She eventually divorces her husband, her massive, you know, husband, who, like, sad to see him go. He was a great guy. Um, but, you know, you're two spies. Like, there's bound to be some kind of, you know, attraction going on there. You know, you're in life or death situations, right? Like, it's going to happen. Can I get a um, mournful yeehaw so in the chat? A mournful yeehaw. Post it. There it is. Right there. Yeah, there it is. Um, there's going to be a graphic. Uh, so she divorces her husband. She marries Kaversky. And she shares... I mean, this is she marries him after the war. But uh, she shares... Like, you'll see the reason she falls in love with him, because they did a bunch of stuff together. They were in France. They were in Cairo. They were all over together. And they're doing all this work for England, and what happens? Their loyalty gets questioned. Their loyalty gets questioned falsely, by the way. They were total uh, patriots. And they're released from their duties, but given a small pension by the SOE and several tasks through to 1943. The Polish government in exile, because Poland's controlled by the USSR and Germany at this point, doesn't like these two because they're working with Britain, and Poland had some gripes with Britain, and Britain doesn't like them because they were connected with Polish intelligence, like in the government in exile. So it's like this, you can't win either way. They're stuck between a rock and a hard place. So they're basically, they're hated on both, both by both of the people that they're trying to help, which is just sucks, especially because they were kind of amazing, right? They, at one point, or at multiple points, drove across literally hundreds of miles of territory occupied by Nazi sympathizers, the whole time carrying incriminating letters and microfilm that were necessary to their duties. And oftentimes they were just weeks or even days ahead of the advancing German army. So they're like, like Bonnie and Clyde and it like rolling down through just Nazi lovers driveways 
carrying stuff that say, yeah, we're spies, here's important things that'll bring down the Russian, you're the German, you know, war machine, blah, blah, blah. And the Nazis are like hot on their trail. Like, and they're doing all of this. And of course, Britain's like, nah, they're, they're probably Nazi spies. Uh, they even provided information that correctly predicted Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union. So they're like, they had their fingers in all kinds of pies. Eventually, in Ding, France, she tricks the Gestapo into releasing captured spies and a French officer. She knew where the spies were being held. How? A. She asked the guard, and he told her. B. She climbed a nearby church steeple and looked inside the prison courtyard. Or C. She whistled a tune, and a spy whistled it back. Wade, go ahead. A. A. She asked a guard and he told her. The way things are going, safe bet. Pat? Yeah. C. You think he whistled, she whistled a tune. Well, Pat gains one. Um, yeah, she knew that this spy liked a certain song because she liked it too. She would whistle it when walking by the prison courtyard and he would whistle back. <laughs> so once she had confirmation, I mean, it's just like, James Bond stuff, you know? I, I love that stuff like this actually happens in real spy things. She spoke with the commandant of the prison and offers him two million francs that the SOE then airdropped to her for the prisoner's release, claiming that one of the spies was her husband. She pressured this commandant for three hours and said, look, the British are on a couple of miles away. They're literally 37 miles away. And they're approaching fast. I'm in contact with the British forces. You know why? Because I've got, I've got radio contact. Here, I'll prove it to you. And she pulled out these crystals from a radio, because radios have these little crystals in them, that were broken and completely useless. And she's like, look, these are, you know, part of my radio. I'm in contact with the British uh, army. And if you let these people go, they'll take care of you. You know, they will not arrest you. And she said... And this is a quote from her. If I were you, speaking to the commandant, I should, get, I should give careful thought to the proposition I have made you. As I told Capitan Sh Schenk, sorry, Schenk, a, uh, a, a captain that she also was negotiating with, if anything should happen to my husband or his friends, the reprisals will be swift and terrible, for I don't have to tell you that both you and the Capitan have an infamous reputation among the locals. So the commandant was like, yo, um, I've murdered a bunch of people here. Uh, I would probably not be loved if I, you know, was captured by all these locals. So, um, I'll, I'll help you out. I'll release the prisoners and you protect me. And they were like, great, you should probably leave France. And the one captain was like, no, and he got murdered by people. And then the other one was like, hey, bro, uh, you said you protect me. And she's like, yeah, and I will. And he was protected. He, she kept her word. He was safeguarded and like survived the war and went on to live afterwards. Um, she did all of this, by the way, during a time where in that very town, there were posters with her face on them, plastered everywhere, saying that she was a spy. And she still negotiated their release and tricked the Gestapo into thinking she was just some soldier. So like, this lady, top tier. And the question for you now is, how top tier was she? How many medals do you think she won during the war? A, none. B, three. Or C, eight. Pat, what did you say? You remember? Uh, a, I'm pretty sure. A was okay, none, so correct? I'm going to tell you. A was none, yeah. So you think yeah. she won yep. no medals. Um, mm. All right. Wade, what about you? Uh, I said A as well. You said A. You think they stiffed her. Well, um, luckily you're both wrong. She won eight. She won eight medals in total. She earned the Officer of the Order of the British Empire, the St. George, or the, sorry, the George Medal, the 1939 to 1945 Star, the Africa Star, the Italy Star, France and Germany Star, 
uh, war medal and the Croix de Guerre, which is a really high honor from the French government. So she got uh, she got pretty decorated. Unfortunately, it didn't save her from the stupidity of her superiors, who l w ditched her after the war and provided her with none of the benefits that she deserved. She eventually had to work as a porter in a hotel in London and was unfortunately murdered on June 15th, 1952 by Dennis Muldowney, a man whose advances she had refused, who was then, like a couple months later, hanged. And I'm not a proponent of the death penalty, but geez, that, that guy makes me mad. Um, uh, her, she wasn't totally lost to history, though. Twelve men, some, including her husband and some of the men that she had saved in uh, that prison in France, fought hard to protect her legacy, uh, stopping several stories and newspaper articles and books that were slanderous of her. She has been honored with a bronze bust in the Polish Hearth Club in London and a plaque at the site of the hotel where she had worked. Her husband died in 1988 and his ashes were flown all the way from Germany to be interred at her grave in England. And one of the men she saved in France actually named his daughter after her. So, you know, she was remembered by a lot of people. Um, and even if the English spies at the time were total jerks to her, she, uh, she, she was an amazing person. So rock and roll, um, to our first heroine, Christina Scarbeck. Um, or maybe not so rock and roll. What do we think? We think this is history. We think this is schmistery. Did I come up with all these details? Give it a little tragic ending to make it seem more realistic. Or is this a true story? Wade, you're the reigning champ right now, so we'll give you first go. What do you think? Thinking history on this one. You're thinking history. You think all of these tales are true. All right. Uh, Pat, what about you? Uh, I'm going to say history. You say history as well. Well, we remain tied. You're right. It is history. She was a real rockin' lady. Um, and I obviously skipped over a bunch of stuff, but uh, she rules. And go check her out. She's uh, she's pretty cool. Um, a lot like our next story. Um, this one ends with a, on a little bit of a more of an up note. So uh, who knows? Maybe maybe it's a fabricated up note. But that is the story of another spy for England during the war who was also a woman, and her name was Odetta Braley. And she was born on, our, on April 28th, 1912. Her father, a banker, was killed at Verdun shortly before the 1918 armistice and was posthumously awarded the Croix de Guerre and the Medaille Militaire, uh, which is actually the third highest honor you can earn in the French army. So, like, she's off to a good start, you know? She's got them fighter jeans in her. And on her. She's wearing fighter jeans. Um, okay. She... <laughs> she has two friends named Jean who both fight. They're bro. They're fighter jeans. Um, yeah. That's how she survives. So, uh, she actually, to emphasize that she does have those fighter jeans, when she was young, she contracted various illnesses, which blinded her for three and a half years, as well as polio. So, like... She took some hits when she was younger, but came out of it, you know, still standing and also able to see. She regained her eyesight. Um, she eventually married an Englishman, Roy Sansom, which is why she'll be referred to as Sansom during this uh, uh, story. Uh, married him on October 27th, 1931, and World War II breaks out eight years later, and he goes and joins the British Army. Um, and she goes and joins... The, our old friends, the SOE, who were total jerks to uh, our last heroine. How does she join them? Does she, A, claim to be a relative of Winston Churchill? Throwback. B, 
mistakenly send a po she mistakenly sent a postcard to the war office, or C she had a knack for spotting Nazi spies, having alerted the n authorities to two suspicious persons that turned out to be spies. Wade, what do you think? I think A. You think A. She claimed she was a relative of Winston Churchill. All right, uh, Pat, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to say B. You say B. She mistakenly sent a postcard to the war office. Well, Pat, you're right. Um, essentially, here's what happened, right? So she's living in France because she, you know, is from France. She's living in France with her husband. War breaks out. He's like, we got to join the English army because I'm an English person. Um, and England is like, look, France is obviously controlled by Nazis right now, by the Germans. We need all photos that you have of the French countryside, be it postcards, you know, personal family photos, all of the things you have so that we know what it looks like so that we can plan a landing there. And she's like, oh, great. I've got those postcards. So she's supposed to send them to this one office and instead sends them to the war office. And the war office people are like, wow, this lady's pretty cool. What's her name again? And they recruit her into, to be a spy. <laughs> so she, she literally, a clerical, like an error on her part, like in a dress <laughs> line, and she became a spy. Like that is the, just... I can't believe that that actually happens. But she does it. Um, she leaves her three daughters uh, in a convent school. So a little bit of a... a there's, that's a choice to do. Um, she leaves her three daughters in a convent school and is trained to be sent into Nazi-occupied uh, France. While she's getting trained, obviously, she gets reviewed. What were the initial reviews of her conduct? A... She was considered impulsive, hasty in judgment, unclear in her mind, and possessing of seductive behaviors. B. She was considered one of the best agents his majesty had at his disposal. Or C. She was thrown out. Wade, what do you say? A. A. You think A. All right, Pat, what about you? C. You think C. She got tossed out. Wade, you're only two points behind. Uh, sh naturally, being a woman in 1940, whatever, uh, they were like, oh, she's impulsive, hasty, quick in her judgment, unclear in her mind. And also, she, like, one of them was literally like, she's very loyal. Or, well, but he was like, uh, she's, she's got all these seductive behaviors, and it's not good, but she's very loyal to England, so I guess she's a good spy. And it's like... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she was kept in. Um, and eventually assigned to land in Cassis, France, in the night of November 2nd, 1942, which she does. And she meets her handler there, Captain Peter Churchill. She was supposed to make contact with the French resistance and establish a safe ho house in Auxerre. At the time, though, the network of spies that they were working with was in crisis because their radio operator... Adolf Rabinovich was vulnerable. He, was, uh, he wasn't really in a good way. So Sansom was redirected, and her new job was to find food and shelter for him, since he was in country illegally as a spy, and also to tend to carelessly placed airdrops, that they would just airdrop these supplies wherever, and she had to go and get them and hide them, which, like... <laughs> Again, we're getting into, like, just the incompetence of these people at the time. Um, so that becomes her new job. She, they eventually are like, all right, we're too exposed here in France, uh, in the southern area of France. We got to move north. So they move up north to an Italian-occupied area. And while they're there, an Opfer counterintelligence officer, a German colonel, infiltrates them. And this is where it's going to get dicey. So he infiltrates them by pretending to be an anti-Nazi colonel and getting in good with one of their friends who then is like, oh yeah, this guy's a good guy. Here's a letter of recommendation. Go talk to them. And he meets them and they're like, hey, we talked to this cool anti-Nazi colonel. He says that he wants to help end the war. And London goes, ah, oh, that guy's very bad. Stay away from him. You know, keep away from that dude. And they're like, okay, we'll keep away from them. We'll leave because he's going to be back in two days. And then he's like, surprise, I'm back now and arrest them. So, they're caught. 
and they are brought to the notorious Fresne prison, which is not notorious really to us, but like at the time was bad place to be. So she's captured by the Gestapo, and naturally the horrible thing happens, and she's interrogated by the Gestapo. How many times, how many times was she interrogated and tortured by the Nazis? Was it A, 5, B, 11, or C, 14? Wade, what do you think? B. B, 11 times. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Pat, what do you think? C. C, 14. Yes, indeed, it was C. It, 14 times this woman was interrogated and tortured, and I'm not going to go into how. I'm just going to go into back-to-back -back question. Did she talk? A, yes. B, no. Pat, what do you think? Did she talk? B. B. He thinks she kept quiet. Wade, what about you? I want B as well. Going with B as well. You're both right. She didn't say a word after 14 different rounds of torture. She never gave up the whereabouts of, Ra of Rabinovich and another British agent. She was the only one who knew where they were, so they focused on her. She stuck to her cover story and actually successfully diverted attention away from her handler, Churchill, who was only interrogated twice. So not only did she take her own interrogation, she was like, oh, focus on me for these reasons, and made them interrogate him, who was actually more high-ranking, less. The colonel that captured her, his name was Bleicher, he actually occasionally would show up and offer to take her to Paris to concerts and dinner and fancy restaurants if she would just, you know, tell him where these two guys were. She refused. So... Because she refused so much, in June 1943, she was condemned to death on two counts. And her words are pretty amazing here. So amazing, I'm not even going to make you guess them. She finds out she's condemned to death for two counts, and she says, and I quote, Then you'll have to make up your mind on what count I'm to be executed, because I can only die once. Like, <laughs> That actually made the colonel so mad, he sent her to Ravensbrück concentration camp. So, which is bad. And also a primarily, if I remember correctly, female uh, concentration camp. And, like, very bad. Yikes. Up there, like, on the levels of Auschwitz. Like, huge. Um, sadly, at the... Uh, it, or the, sorry, Rabinovich, the um, man she was protecting, was actually captured by the Gestapo and executed in 1944. But still, the fact that she didn't give him up, man, like, I would have talked. So, she's in Ravensbrück and she endures the horrors of concentration camps. Obviously, I'm not going to go into those because they're too unspeakable to even talk about. Um, but needless to say, she, uh, she's dealing with a lot. And she actually survives the entire ordeal from, so two years she survives in concentration camp. She attributes her endurance to her experience with illness as a child, having dealt with so much, as well as an example set by her grandfather, who was apparently a, a really tough dude. Um, she said she accepted her fate that she would inevitably be captured and killed. And because she accepted her death, she said it denied the Nazi Nazis the pleasure of her actually suffering because she just kind of rolled with it. Said that she took it a minute at a time, focusing on how to survive one minute to one minute, not even focusing on what would happen 30 minutes from now, just one moment to the next. So her mentality kept her alive, but something else saved her. What was it? Was it A, another prisoner volunteered to go to the gas chambers instead of her, B, a German guard snuck her food, or C, she claimed to be a relative of Winston Churchill. Pat, what do you think? C. You think C. You think all this time I've just been building to this one thing. All right, uh, Wade, what about you? B. B, uh, that a German guard snuck her food. Well, Pat is right. She claimed that she was a relative of Winston Churchill, 
that her handler, Colonel Churchill, who is not related to the Prime Minister at all, um, was his nephew, and that she was married to that guy, so that, like, hey, I'm a relative of Winston Churchill, you can use me as a bargaining chip. And they would do that. They believed her. Um, just for note, A, another prisoner volunteering to go to the gas chambers actually happened once in Auschwitz. I believe it's the only example of it ever happening. And it was a Franciscan monk um, who, named Maximilian Kolbe, who volunteered to go for a complete stranger, a guy he didn't even know, and went to the gas chambers instead of him. So, top tier human being right there. Um, but focusing on um, our gal here, uh, she was, she survived this whole time through all these ordeals, and eventually the American base was uh, a few miles away from Ravensburg. It, the end was inevitable, and the commandant, uh, Fritz Zuren, said, you know what, I got the niece of Winston Churchill here, uh, what a great bargaining chip. I'm going to use her. So he drives her to the American base and surrenders. And he says, look, I brought you Winston Churchill's niece. Rock and roll, guys. Like, let's give me immunity. Um, and he was like, I'm saved. He wasn't. Because uh, she wasn't his niece. It was a lie. In reality, she testified in the Nuremberg trials against the Ravensbrück people. And that commandant was executed in 1950. So, like, again... Not a proponent of capital punishment, but that he kind of had that one coming. Like, that is one of the biggest bamboozlings of history that I've ever heard of. And rock and roll her. Um, she eventually dies. Uh, well, sorry. She remarries her handler, Peter Churchill, um, in 1947. Divorces him in 1956 and remarries another former SOE officer that same year. So, it's just a spy extravaganza going on in her life. Um, and she passes away in, on March 13th, 1995, in England, aged 82. So, she lived out a nice long life, this amazing uh, woman. But there was one last thing that happened to her, one last little crazy bit that I couldn't resist putting in. Um, so... What last crazy thing happened in her life? A, while flying on an airplane, she fell out and survived. B, she was formally adopted by Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Or C, someone stole a George Cross from her home and then returned it with an apology note. All right, uh, Pat, you got there first. What do you think? B. B, you think yeah. Winston Churchill formally adopted her. I also want to just preface, this is the American Sign Language letter or handshape for B. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, okay. that is actually, we've done this throughout all the rest of the episodes, but now is actually kind of a good time to point out that's B. This is A, this else. is C. <laughs> we would not have gotten this far in the episode if I thought Alex <laughs> was doing this. Um, all right, so you think B, Winston Churchill was like, this lady's crazy, I'm an adopter. Uh, all right, uh, Wade, what about you? I think C. You think C. Um, well, Wade, you are right. Someone stole how this went down. In 1951, someone broke into her home and stole her George Cross, which, if I'm not mistaken, is, I know it's a medal, an English medal. I, I'm not sure if it was her English medal or some other religious symbol, but regardless, very near and dear to her. So they steal this thing, okay? And her mom puts out an appeal. I don't know how. This is not like Facebook, but she puts out an appeal for the thief to return it which they did with a note saying, and I quote, you, madam, appear to be a dear old lady. God bless you and your children. I thank you for having faith in me. I am not all that bad, it's just circumstances. Your little dog really loves me. I gave him a nice pat and left him a piece of meat out of the fridge. Sincerely yours, a bad egg. Like, 
what kind of topsy-turvy world does that happen in? That is the absolute epitome of the meme. You're a bad guy, but that doesn't mean you are bad, bad guy. That, the real-life example of that meme. So, I mean, I just had to throw that in there. It's amazing. Um, naturally, it's true. Uh, that I threw that in there, or did I just throw that in there with other stuff that I threw in there? What do we think, boys? History or schmistery? Can we have two amazing uh, 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 female spies in England during the World War II? Pat, you're in the lead, so we're gonna let you go first. What do you think? Schmistery. You think schmistery? It didn't schmappen. It did not schmappen. All right, Wade. What about you? Schmistery. You think schmistery? You think I made it up? Didn't schmappen. Well, Wade, I was really pulling for you. This is history. This is true. This all really happened. I know. I. Uh, and there's a long list online of these amazing spies. One of them was a Major League Baseball player who, like, was going to assassinate, uh, the, what's his name? Um, Oppenheimer. And I read like, this. didn't. Yes. Uh, or he Heidenberg. What? I, re I read a book about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was going to assassinate, um, uh, Hindenburg. I think it was, it was Hindenburg. Um, because they were like, hey, figure out if they're close to an atomic bomb. And he was like, they're not. And they're like, like, okay, you don't have to kill them. He's like, okay, they, cool. And then, a, that uh, was a... And then he blimp. went crazy. Yeah, he he was a uh, well Hindenburg was a uh, was a uh, was it he was a politician. I don't actually think it was Hindenburg. It's something with an H, but that's what the blimp was named after. And also, oh, the humanity. Um, brief him. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of crazy spies, but these two stood out because they're amazing. Um, but uh, with that, we have Pat as our champion today with 13 points, <laughs> Wade with 10. Wade, if you had gotten that last uh. history mystery question, you would have won by two points. But um, there it is. Certainly not as contentious an election as the one that's going on right now or for you folks happened already. I'm sure there was a whole lot of screaming going on. Um, but... Uh, yeah, clear and cut. There it is. Right on the, the day. Um, we're going to give Pat his certificate so he can go vote. Um, he retakes his crown. Uh, and we'll see if we can maybe narrow that gap of, what is it now, four to one um, yes. next time. But there you go, Pat. That's for you. Uh, take it. Enjoy. And, oh, look at that. Look at the editing skills right there wow. um that'll do it for us uh here at uh, amazing just fantastic that'll do it for us here at history <laughs> mystery i'm asher wertheimer your host that's wade foster uh that's pat fitzgerald thank you all for joining us um i hope you all voted i hope you enjoyed these laid back things appreciate spies don't steal george crosses um and most importantly good night <laughs>